Lauren, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Rainer. Um, oh, I'm just yes. waiting. For, Lauren is the host, so I'm just waiting for Lauren to give the word. Okay. Yeah, I yeah, I was just getting ready to say it. I think it's ten o'clock, so if you want to go ahead and start, Abhijit, I think. That's... Um, yeah, if everything is ready, then I think I am. Uh, okay. So, oh, hello, everyone. Um, so we have Professor Reiner Fries to give the first of two um, general introduction lectures, one on theory and one on experiment. Uh, so Reiner will give the, the theory overview. He's a professor at Texas A&M University. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, he is the inventor of uh, the recombination um, uh, principle that that uh, on which you know uh, there's been tons and tons of work in heavy ion uh, collisions. Um, regarding the lecture, so there are there is a new channel now in the Slack which is called theory hyphen freeze. So you should put your questions in there. Okay and. Um, only very urgent things should go into the Zoom. Try to avoid using the Zoom uh, chat as much as possible. So try to post your questions in Slack. Uh, we will try to let Reiner uh, finish speaking unless there's a very urgent question uh, that needs to be addressed. And uh, then the questions will be read back to him from Slack or Reiner can read them from Slack as well. And if you, are one of the people who asked a question on Slack and that was answered, but you still want to do a follow-up, you should raise your hand on the Zoom. Okay, so with that, Reiner, take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Abhishek. Um, a small clarification, I'm one of the co-inventors, I guess, uh, of recrimination, so not to make other people upset. Um, okay, well, um, welcome. It's, uh, it's nice to see so many people signed up and uh, actively participating in this Jet uh, Jetscape School. That's really great. So um, I have the task to talk about um, sort of an overview, theory overview uh, regarding event generators and Monte Carlo methods. And uh, that's of course um, a lot to cover. So obviously I will just uh, basically try to give you the big picture, okay? so. Uh, basically, there are two parts to the talk, and then there's a summary. So I want to spend a little bit of time on the question uh, why we actually uh, bother uh, generating, you know, building event generators. Um, what um, what is there that uh, we can do that we otherwise maybe cannot do? So why do we actually use Monte Carlo method, methods for that? Um, and then I want to go specifically to high energy nuclear collisions because that's of course what Jetscape is about and spend some time introducing the different aspects of that. Um, and um, first very general, but then maybe um, circling um, a little bit closer to what actually Jetscape is doing. And then um, in the end, it will be the summary. Okay, so, um, so why Monte Carlo event generators? If you talk to uh, people outside of heavy ion physics, or actually outside of nuclear and particle physics, um, they might be surprised uh, about this concept of an event generator. Uh, it probably has to do with the fact that uh, experimentalists in other fields typically have much better control over a lot of things that they do in their labs. Um, and we have actually very little control besides um, dialing the energy of the accelerator and um, you know, which nucleus or which, you know, which particles we put in there. So uh, there's, um, there's a lot of room for fluctuations. So not a single event is really like uh, any other event that you get out from a heavy ion collision. I actually haven't really um, you know, tried to verify this mathematically in terms of probability, but um, uh, it's a very fluctuation dominant business, uh, certainly. So um, now if you look at observables, um, you see that um, if you, if you start out with something as a theorist that you say, well, let's cut some corners, let's, let's start out with something where actually um, I already do some, some averaging over these fluctuations and then I calculate my observable, um, then you might end up with something that um, 
that is not the same as if you really um, have your full events, your full blown events, and then calculate observables like uh, uh, experimentalists do. So uh, what do I mean with the right hand side? Maybe I should clarify a little bit. So one of the um, examples here could be, for example, that you look at fluid dynamics, um, or also there could be other um, uh, other um, examples, but this is a really sort of uh, a historical, historically important um, uh, example. So if you look at um, the input to fluid dynamics, um, you would say if you want to do some kind of um, average event, you take an average nucleus, which is basically the circle here uh, on, the, on, on the right, and then you have another nucleus, which is the circle here to the left, and they have a certain overlap here, which is this almond-shaped zone, and you can use sort of this um, um, almond-shaped input uh, in your fluid dynamic calculations and uh, run your simulations and calculate observables from that. And uh, you can see right away that just for symmetry reasons, uh, you will never get something like this triangular shape that you actually can get if you introduce fluctuations of the nucleons that can happen. So um, overlaid here um, over these circles are actually uh, calculations where you have a sampling of possible nucleon positions and uh, you can easily get something that has some kind of triangular shape. So it has a, a triangular eccentricity, which is called epsilon 3 and the details are not really important. Um, the important thing is that this can translate into um, a triangular flow of particles, which was found um, more than 10 years ago and for a while was really a puzzle until people uh, figured out, well, we have to be really careful uh, with event averaging. So it's just a little uh, anecdote here uh, to show that um, what we really have to do in this business is we should uh, calculate uh, events and uh, we have to do that by sampling probability distributions and then calculate the observables. Uh, if we do that, then we sort of get close to what uh, is actually done in experiment. So there's different kind of fluctuations. So the previous example already introduced initial state fluctuations. So where do they come from? We have no control over the impact parameter or the orientation of the nuclei um, as they collide, if you have non-spherical nuclei. But also you have to remember that the time scale of one of these heavy ion collisions is very, very short compared to the intrinsic time scales of these wave functions of the nuclei. Um, they are, because of the large Lorentz boost, they are um, uh, time dilated. So everything, every, all the changes uh, inside the nuclei happen very slowly. So basically you get a frozen picture uh, in the collision. So um, the nucleons in, in the nucleus that might have arranged themselves in some way given by the shell model or uh, some kind of um, uh, quantum mechanical picture that you have of a nucleus, um, they they will be sort of surprised and and measured by this collision, and that's when you get these random these uh, randomly fluctuating uh, pictures like the one already on the previous side, and the one that is shown here again. So these are typical initial state fluctuations. In this case, just initial state fluctuations of nucleons, uh, and they are certainly very important. Now. During the dynamical evolution now of our system, uh, there's other, um, there's other uh, uncertainties uh, that come in. So we might have classical probability distributions that we have to sample from. For example, heavy quarks um, experience something like Brownian motion in quark gluon plasma. Or if you have um, a fluid dynamic calculation, uh, you deal with fluid cells, but in the end, of course, you want to have particles, you want to have hadrons, so you have to sample those uh, thermal distributions or uh, distributions at least that are somehow related to thermal distributions. Uh, and then, of course, there could also be um, uh, quantum fluctuations uh, in such a system. For example, you don't have classical radiation fields in final state radiation. We have individual gluons, and uh, uh, so we have to sample uh, under which condition these gluons uh, are emitted. Okay, so to do this, we need to know the probability distributions of these processes. So if we don't know these 
uh, probability distributions, then um, there's uh, really no chance to um, to say anything about it. But if if we know them uh, and we put them into our simulations, so they may be part of our simulations, then we can start to accumulate large number of events, and we can start to calculate uh, observables. So um, a lot of uh, processes, and um, in turn, then the modules that are, for example, in Jetscape modules in these um, uh, Monte Carlo event generators, they have sampling as um, an intrinsic part of their of their dynamics. For example, parton Chao Monte Carlos, uh, but even modules like fluid dynamics that are in principle deterministic uh, still need sampling usually for the initial conditions or maybe for the final uh, particle output. So there are some uh, very nice methods available, and uh, I'm actually going to talk about just a few of those um, in the next couple of slides. But of course, the probability distributions, they need to be determined by physics. And sometimes there is a very good theory that tells us what these probability distributions are, maybe something from perturbative QCD. Uh, sometimes um, we actually cannot really um, uh, calculate them from first principles, um, and we have to rather model them or make some uh, some reasonable assumptions. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, methods that are available to us for sampling probability distribution functions. So um, the first one that I want to talk about is rejection sampling because it's very, very simple and I think um, uh, also uh, very intuitive and um, it can go a long way. So you start out with a uh, probability distribution f of x, so x is sort of our um, variable here. And um, on the right, you see an example. I just put together something that's uh, very simple, um, just um, uh, two Gaussians basically that were added up. And that's sort of the function that we want to, uh, want to sample. So we want to uh, get uh, an ensemble of um, values x uh, whose distribution whose histogram and a histogram them in the end gives us back our function f of x, right? So um, if it's really a proper probability uh, density distribution, it should be positive definite. And, um, and of course, it should integrate to 1. Um, um, yeah. So for the rejection sampling, um, what one does is one usually uses uh, something sometimes called a proposal function. Uh, so another function p of x, and basically what we want to do is we want to create something like an upper bound for f. Now this proposal function, um, in the simplest case, you can just take maybe uh, something constant, uh, something that uh, basically uh, sits here on top of the maximum, the highest peak of your probability distribution. Um, but if uh, it, it might be so, uh, sometimes better to actually uh, choose a function where uh, that sort of resembles the shape of f because it can actually save a lot of uh, uh, numerical cost. Um, this p of x is something that you also that you will need to sample directly, so it should be easy, easily sampleable. So, if it's a constant a constant function, uh, no problem, of course. Uh, if you have something uh, for which you have maybe a library available, um, that will also do. So. Uh, here I chose just another Gaussian function just to um, explain the principle. So this is the uh, the golden curve here. Um, now what I've done here, so the p of x is, um, is is not yet properly normalized to do its job. So what I'm going, what I'm doing here is uh, I take the ratio of f uh, of my original probability distribution divided by p and basically take the largest value. Okay. And what I really want is sort of this function m times p. So this is this function m times p, and that is always larger in the entire range in which I'm interested in than the function f. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I will um, now throw dice, and what I'm going to do is I will sample that function um, m p, so I will get values of x. But I really want to sample f, the more complicated function. And what I'm going to do is I will accept or reject a, um, a value of uh, x if um, an additional random number that I sample between 0 and 1, so a probability, uh, is smaller than this ratio f over mp. OK? So, um, so this here is always, uh, the right-hand side is always between 0 and 1. So, there's always, uh, so this always here makes sense. 
And if I do that, I get this uh, nice picture here on the right hand side. So this is uh, 10,000 points that I've sampled from this uh, distribution MP. And then I applied this to each of these points, I applied this criterion here. Um, and then in blue, it shows the ones that have been accepted. And in red, it shows the ones that have been rejected. And uh, you can receive by, by eye sort of that, indeed the blue points resemble our original function that we wanted to sample. Now, what is plotted here is you have to scale it up again by uh, MP. So this is what's really plotted is, uh, is sort of uh, M MP times X, XI here. Uh, MP of the, uh, of the value XI, okay? So now you can actually really check. Um, so all the XIs that have been uh, accepted, uh, do they really uh, add up as a histogram to the original function? And if you do that, so 10,000 is not yet great, there are some fluctuations, but you can see that basically um, you've got it, okay? So this is um, rejection uh, sampling, and there is, um, um, other versions of this that are more fancy, but um, it is one of the, the simpler uh, ways of uh, sampling uh, simple distributions. Okay, so what are other um, methods that you can use? So, well, if the distribution function is really simple, then um, there's usually some direct methods and uh, um, I can, I, um, I, I will get to that a little bit later. Uh, another interesting one is um, the sampling of cumulative distributions. It's also known as inverse transform sampling. And uh, the idea here is basically if you have a distribution function, if you calculate the cumulative distribution, so basically you integrate uh, the, the probability distribution up to a certain value, and that is your new function. So this always has to be between uh, zero and one, because if you integrate over the entire probability distribution, obviously um, the value that you have to get is one. So um, generically, you always have a shape like this here. And then what you can do is you can actually sample the values of this cumulative function here, which is just throwing dice between zero and one, uh, random number between zero and one. And then when you invert this cumulative function, basically say you get this value, uh, you look up what this value is. This is um, a value in your in your random uh, in your random variables, and uh, so if you take a sample like that, you will get a properly distributed uh, ensemble of these uh, random variables that resemble your original uh, distribution functions. And I'll have an example in just a little bit. Um, there are now. There are limits to the what these um, uh, what these um, methods here can do. So there are some more general ones that are usually based on something like Markov chains, for example, the Metropolis algorithm. Uh, I will not really go into details, just to say that um, there is really now uh, here you create a sequence of um, a sequence of um, random variables. So the uh, the next step, sort of the next variable that you choose. Um, depends on the previous one, uh, but if you do it right, if you do it um, um, uh, long enough after a certain burn-in, uh, you can actually uh, uh, get back the original distribution functions, uh, and that's um, uh, an algorithm that is also very much uh, used. Uh, but has to be careful here with correlations, because uh, it's not sort of by, uh, by construction, sort of everything independent, um, but there are methods to ensure that um, you get good results. Okay, so I see. Oh yeah, so here's the, uh, the second example that I quickly wanna go through, and this is maybe a little bit more physical. Um, so I wanted to go back to this example of um, what you have to do uh, at the end of a fluid dynamic calculation when you have to convert fluid cells for which you know the macroscopic parameters like temperature, maybe a, a, um, a collective flow velocity, uh, you have to convert those into particles, say hadrons. So we want to sample basically a, a, a thermal blast wave cell. And I'm going to do this basically using these first two methods. So um, yeah, so the physical situation is that you have a um, collection of particles in a volume. Um, it has a certain temperature 
and it has a certain collective flow velocity. Okay, so uh, just as you have it in a fluid cell, or maybe if you've worked with a blast wave, um, it's basically the same principle. The distribution is given, at least we assume here, that it's basically a boosted Boltzmann distribution, so we're not bothering about quantum corrections. And um, we're also not bothered with uh, deviations from thermal equilibrium, just to keep it simple. So the distribution function, as a, as a function of the momentum p, is something like e to the minus p dot u over t, uh, where t is the temperature and u is the four velocity of the collective motion of that, of that cell, and p is the particle for momentum. So we want to, we want to sample that. And say get 100 or 1,000, um, or maybe it should be determined by the volume of the cell, but a certain number of particles out. And let's just do one uh, species of particles. OK, so how do we do this? Now, um, the, uh, the first method that I had suggested in the previous slide basically um, is based on uh, transformations. So if you can apply transformations to make your sampling easier, to make your life easier, you should do that. So one thing you can do is you can apply a Lorentz transformation here um, because you know flow, the flow velocity of the cell, so you can always boost into the rest frame of that cell. And what does it buy you? Well, what it buys you is that now once you're in the rest frame and you really have a thermal distribution, um, you have a rotational symmetry. Your thermal distribution is um, invariant under rotations and um, you didn't have that before because the flow velocity broke that rotational symmetry. So the first step, um, and again, there's certainly other method, methods to um, do this sampling, but this is now the one that um, I want to uh, go through uh, so that uh, we can see some of the methods that were in the previous slide. So um, you transform into cell rest frame. And um, so how do you get back? Let's already think about this. Well. Once you have all the particle momenta in, in the rest frame, it's easy to apply that Lorentz boost again, sort of the inverse Lorentz boost, and calculate the momenta that they have um, in the original lab frame, right? So we end up now with a distribution function, which is just e to the minus the energy. Um, and for the rest frame quantities, I use this tilde symbol, e to the minus energy over t. So, now we have a rotational symmetry, so we can break it up and factorize it into um, the three spherical coordinates. And I can write this f of p tilde, which is um, physicists would write this as dn over d3 p tilde. Uh, there's actually a d3x as well. Um, but um, so that's just some factor of volume, uh, which is required both for um, for dimensional reasons, but also to give it the right, the correct properties on the Lorentz transformations, um, uh, the density. Um, uh, so it's uh, that factor is not here, that factor of volume, uh, because in the end we'll not use um, a particular normalization here. So we we'll just uh, absorb that in normalization. So I can write it in this way as a dn d phi, a dn. Well, instead of theta, I already write dn d cosine theta, and then dn dp tilde, okay? And by writing it as basically as a function of some effective variable u, which is cosine theta, um, again, I've reduced it, um, this, the sampling of this here in, to something very, very simple. Uh, it's just a constant distribution. So there's no trouble at all. The only, the only work we have to do is really for this dn dp tilde, um, which has this shape now. So you basically absorb this Jacobian here uh, a momentum squared uh, in addition to this exponential function here. And the other, the other two distributions are just flat and are extremely simple to sample. So now for the sampling of this um, uh, dn dp tilde, I suggest the, um, the method of sampling the cumulative distribution. Uh, it's easy to calculate this. So um, you just calculate numerically this cumulative distribution f of p, p is sort of the upper limit in this integral, that uh, integral over p is small tilde. And um, here's a particular example where um, I put in some parameters, pions at 120 MeV. Temperature, the pions have about 140 MeV. So this would be this function, um, the NDP uh, in some normalization. 
And this is the cumulative distribution that you get. Okay, so um, again, as before, we've seen um, already that uh, it has to be always between zero and one. And now what you can do is you can simply pick your random numbers between zero and one here. Uh, and for each random number, say we do again, um, I think I did 10,000. So you do 10,000 of those, um, you get the inverse value. That's your candidate um, or your, um, not just a candidate, but that is the value that you take uh, and make part of your ensemble of, of momenta. And when you do that, you get indeed a very nice histogram back again for this um, function, uh, the NDP tilde. So this shows this cumulative um, uh, sampling works. Now, just to, um, to make this sort of complete, we also, we should not forget about the, the two angles, the theta and the phi. So if we sample them and then put together uh, the momentum vector of these, then you can look at, for example, one of the components, say the PX component, uh, and this is now the MDPX, um, both the original analytic form and the sample form that you get uh, by putting together those three random numbers that you get um, for phi, for theta, or, uh, cosine theta, and the p tilde. Okay, so um, yeah, so this works nicely. There's, uh, I didn't uh, bother with the Lorentz transformation here, uh, but if you want to, um, you can of course add that, okay? And in fact, um, that's sort of the first part of, um, of the talk and um, uh, if you want, you can uh, work on some homework problems uh, that sort of fall out of this right away. Um, the first one is something that you might have done this already uh, in, you know, even as early as high school or middle school. Um, I don't know, but if you haven't done this, I think it's actually a really nice um, uh, way to get started uh, with these kind of methods. It's sort of this um, way of statistically determining the value of pi. Uh, and basically what you do is you do a uh, rejection sampling here in, in two dimensions and you can take a full circle here, it's a quarter circle, it's so, so some kind of segment and obviously you can relate the area here to, to pi and uh, you know, that will be part of the homework uh, if you wish and uh, then you can write a brief code um, that actually does the, the calculation. Um, and the second uh, suggested homework is that you simply try to retrace the steps that I laid out for the sampling of a boosted thermal distribution. Okay, so um, what I can suggest is maybe 100 thermal pions at a temperature of 120 MeV uh, and with a collective velocity of 0.7 C in X direction. Okay, and um, it's, not, it's not too tricky. Um, so hopefully with the methods that uh, we discussed, uh, this should be uh, easy. Um, again, there are certainly other methods than the ones that I suggested here uh, to solve this. So if you want to do it in, in a different way, that's of course also fine. Uh, we don't really have a hands-on session for this, uh, for this talk here. So, um, but if you want to contact me on Slack about the homework, uh, please um, feel free to do so later. Okay, so that sort of concludes the, uh, the first part of, um, of this. And, um, Rainer, and now let me... Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, so I, I think you have to give some indication to Julia because uh, she's going to stop and start the recording so that we don't have one large one hour okay. talk and, and have it like a. So is this a good point to do that? This, this would be a good point, certainly. Yeah. OK, thank okay. you. I will stop and restart. OK.